Praise the Lord. Did you bring your Bibles? Amen. Amen. Well, let's make our declaration this morning because we're going to get in this. We're going to have some fun for the next few moments. Say this with me. This is my Bible. I live by its truth. I walk in its light. I rest in its promises. I'm empowered by its love. And I overcome by the faith produced from receiving this seed sown into my heart. Father, we thank you today. We can make that declaration in the land of the free and the home of the brave. We thank you today as we remember the lives that have been given. This is the Sunday before Memorial Day when we remember all of our men and women who have served in our armed forces and who have given their lives for the cause of freedom. So, Father, today we pray your blessing over every home, over every life, over every family member who has been a part of paying the ultimate price for freedom with a life given through love, through honor and courage. So, Father, today we pray your blessing upon this day in Jesus' name. And somebody said, Amen. Amen. Well, before we dive into this, I have a clip that I want to play for you just as an introduction this morning. forget. Amen? And uh, even as we look now today and even in our culture, there's a lot of things that aren't being taught in our schools in the way of history and that. But since the inception of our nation, over one million lives have been given in the battle for freedom, to protect, preserve, and to ensure our freedom. So we need never forget, praise the Lord. So today as a nation, we still enjoy the life, freedoms, and liberties purchased by the lives and sacrifices of others on our behalf. We are continually protected by men and women who volunteer for service to their nation to defend and secure the cause of freedom for all. So if anyone served, if you served or any family member served, you are to be honored and to be remembered for your service to others. Could you say amen? So our military and our uh, people who served in armed forces, they have earned the right to be honored and respected and remembered for your service to others. You see, the parallels between the church and serving our country are amazingly similar. The church can be and do no less. The church is built on, on and through the lives of those who believe in the cause of Christ with the same conviction For the cause of freedom. You see, they choose to volunteer with their lives and live a life of service for the cross. They are willing to live, fight, and if need be, die to proclaim and defend the freedom that was purchased by one for all. Think about that. Jesus is the one man who was worth all men, and he gave his life that all might be free. Think about this. The kingdom of God, like our nation, does not have a draft. It asks for volunteers. In our nation, nobody is being drafted in the military service. Nobody is in harm's lay because they were forced to be there. The men and women who are serving our nation are men and women who have made a free will choice to go and to be there. Amen? And so that is what deserves the highest honor is people who have made that choice. And even when it comes to serving Christ, the gospel is preached by people who make the choice to enlist in the army of the Lord and to serve that souls might be set free from the oppression of the enemy and be found freedom that belongs to them 
through Christ. And one thing we're going to have to fight, the church is going to have to be careful that you haven't allowed yourself to be lulled into a state of, of lethargic laziness. Through this time, we're not engaged in work. We're not engaged in this. And so the church has been disengaged. We're going to have to actively re-engage in being the church and serving and committing our lives to doing that. We can't just afford, like I said, we can't afford just to settle for church being the place where I don't have to get up. I don't even have to get out of my jammies. I can be eating my Fruit Loops right now while I'm watching Pastor preach in my jammies with my feet up on the coffee table. If I need some coffee, I can get up and go and get some more coffee. I can do this or that. I can just kick back I can fall asleep and nobody will even know it <laughs> amen more than anything else I don't have to serve in children's church amen I don't have to serve I don't have to do anything I can just sit here and feed me anyway moving right along hallelujah <laughs> Glory to God. So watch this. We have to make sure we don't allow that to happen. What motivates people, what motive? let me ask this question, what motivates people to volunteer for service? What motivates people? What motivates you? What should motivate anybody to volunteer for service? What motivates young men to volunteer and women to volunteer into active duty service to put their life on the line? I think it is this. It is when we personally become aware of the truth and the fact that someone thought my life and freedom was worth giving their life for. Somebody thought our lives and our freedom was worth giving their life for. The reason we have freedom in America today is because people thought it was worth fighting for, preserving, and protecting. And somebody else, the next generation, the next person comes behind and believes that cause is a worthy cause to give their life for. Whether it has been on the cross or on the field of battle. Praise the Lord. So freedom is not, is not an idea or a moral concept that can be merely bestowed or conferred upon a people, a nation, or a society. Freedom is the byproduct of sacrifice. The costly price that is paid to both secure it and to protect it. Matthew chapter 26, Jesus says, it says this of Jesus, and he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Or in other words, Jesus was committed to freeing humanity from the oppression of sin. And if there was an easier way to do it than to lay down his life to do it, he was saying, Father, is there any other way? But freedom is worth the ultimate sacrifice. And he was willing to go all the way for us. Uh, you see, the cause of freedom cannot be secured, preserved, or protected through tolerance. You don't tolerate with evil. You don't tolerate with oppression. You have to actually fight. Only through diligence, service, and sacrifice for the common good of all and for the right of all to be free can freedom be protected. So hear me this morning. There is a cause to saying no. There's a cost to saying no. If we say, no, I don't want to fight, I don't want to stand up, I don't want to serve, I don't want to do that, then there will be a cost to saying no. And there is a power in saying yes. We need to remember that. Jesus knew the cost would be too high for us if he said no. This is what Jesus said, nobody takes my life, I freely choose to lay it down. He volunteered for the service of the cross. Nobody made him go. He chose to go on your behalf and on my behalf because he knew that if he didn't go, the cost of his no would be too much for us to bear. So he chose to live by the power of a yet. Think about it. We would have been forever separated from God and lost in our sin with no remedy or recourse for restoration. Unable to save ourselves, we would have been doomed for eternity. So he said yes. Because of that pride, he chose to say yes. So the power of a yes tells us that freedom is not free. We have freedom from sin because of his yes in the garden to go to the cross. We have freedom and liberty in America because of a yes said and paid for by so many. We can never afford to forget 
that our freedom has never been free. And there are people today all around us that are bearing and carrying the weight and the heaviness of the price of freedom that have been paid for others for us. Watch this next clip, if you would, please. You know, there's a story about a guy named Joshua. From the Bible? Yeah. Yeah, that's the one. God told him to build a memorial out of stones. Yeah, and the stones were to be a reminder of this great thing that God had done. So we know it's not the same thing, but we were wondering if we could remember your dad with you. Remember all the great things he's done. Sure. So this one here, this one's for remembering a great friend. This is uh, for his part, keeping my kids safe at night. You got one? Not yet. Not yet, okay. Um, this one's for him being the reason I even know anything at all about the Bible. <laughs> yeah, me too, actually. This is for dragging us to church that first time. This is for freedom to worship and his sacrifice for that. This one's for not letting his best friends stay mad at each other. You know, he loved the simple things. Things like people getting to speak their mind or having dreams and pursuing them. This is for defending those things. You know, you don't have to do this if you don't want to. I want to. It's okay, buddy. Just take your time then. This one's not just for my dad, but for all the people like him who helped protect their country. I'll skip to that one. God. We need never forget. Amen? Never forget. Praise the Lord. So every day we're faced with an innumerable amount of choices. We are given a virtual plethora of options and directions when it comes to making our choices. There are those around us who choose to live only for the moment. With all the influences and opportunities of life that are before us, I think there's still a question that we must all be asked and answer, each of us within our own hearts. And that's this, what is truly worth living for and what is truly worth dying for? We have to answer that. I know it's not the cheeriest subject matter to examine today or any day, but it is a life question that I believe we must each ask ourselves. What do I believe is worth living for? And what do I really believe would be worth dying for? Is there anything that I would put my life on the line for? Or is everything negotiable? Compromisable? Because if I don't believe it enough to die for it, then maybe I really don't believe it. That's right. It's easy to live for it until it becomes a choice maybe to have to die for it. And that's the choice that our men and women have made to protect our freedom. You see, the foundational core of our Christian faith is this. Hear me this morning. There is a God that believes that we, His creation, were not only worth living for, but we were worth the very life of His Son. You and I were worth dying for. So what's the value of a soul? What's the value of a nation? A life? 
and the cause of freedom. How costly is it to redeem a soul? How much would God be willing to pay to do so? You see, to be a true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is to know and to understand why He died. That God felt that us, our freedom, our liberty, our being removed and set free from under the oppressive yoke of the bondage of sin was worth giving the very life of His Son to procure our freedom. Jesus said there was no greater love than to lay down one's life for a friend in John 15. There are many heroic acts and deeds done to save a life, but what about saving a soul? Think about that. You see, part of our freedom, even in America, is the right to engage in evangelism. In telling people that not only do they live in a free nation, not only do they have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, but they have a right to be free from the yoke and the bondage of sin. They have a right to eternal life in relationship with the Heavenly Father. We have the freedom and the right to declare the truth. Amen? So I want to, as I prepared for this this morning, I remembered back to an account that happened in May of 2012, eight years ago, of a heroic deed. And uh, I thought it was very apropos for today in the application of this. In May of 2012, there was just such a heroic deed. There was a plane crash involving five graduates from ORU as they were heading to an Acquire the Fire rally. Their plane crashed into a field, skidded 200 feet, and hit the trees, bursting into flames. Three of the five passengers were killed instantly in the crash. Two were still alive, Hannah Luce, Ron Luce's daughter, and Austin Anderson, a 27-year-old Marine veteran who had served two tours of duty in Iraq. The reports are that he made the choice to pull her from the flames, knowing he was risking his own life in the process. He then helped her to the road where they flagged down help. After arriving at the hospital, Austin died from the trauma of having burns, receiving burns over 90% of his body. So the process of getting Hannah out of the plane caused him to, have, to be burned over 90% of his body. Hannah, when she came to, she was unable to speak because of being on a respirator, but she asked for a piece of paper and she wrote on the paper, Austin saved me. Austin saved me. So I want you to think about that. Here's a young man, he could have saved himself. And in order to save her, he had to put his life in danger. Because something had been instilled in him. Something had been impregnated into his very being and his, and his nature of who he had become as a man. You see, as we read, Jesus said, Greater love has no, ha, has no man than to lay down his life for a friend. Austin made that choice for his friend. This was a heroic act to save a life. But what about saving a soul? Every person you and I know or meet in this life that is not accepted, believed in, received, and given their life to Christ is in danger of the fires of hell. We don't think about that. Every person we meet is in danger of an eternal place of judgment and separation from God. They need someone who will love them enough to rescue them. And think about what is happening in our culture today. We're all being told to pull back and only live for the protection of our personal life. And if we get reduced down, if the church allows itself to be reduced down to just the protection of our own life, then I doubt that we can call ourselves the church. Because we did not come into existence and you do not come to know Christ except by coming through the door that was made available to one who gave his life that you might be free. And to reduce it down to just live our life for self-preservation is not true Christianity. I'm probably not making friends, but that is not my job. 
So this was a heroic act to save a life. Think about it. Someone who will make the choice of putting their reputation, their pride, and maybe even their very life on the line to save them. We have countless stories. If you read Fox's Book of Martyrs, if you read the history of the church, if you read about missionaries who have gone around the world, they thought it was worth their life to get the gospel to people who had never heard the gospel before. And so they gave their life. One missionary said they were told as they were going into an indigenous people. And they said, if you go there, there are cannibals there. Those are notorious people. If you go there, you will die. And the missionary answered back and said, we died before we came. We gave our life before we came. Our life is no longer our own. So think about this. You see, Austin, for Austin, he couldn't wait for another day. He couldn't wait for a more convenient time to make a difference in Hannah's life. Many times that's where we get caught up. We're waiting for another day, a better opportunity, a better time. And we think we'll have that time to reach someone, to tell someone. But in that situation, you never know how much time you have. He only had one opportunity, one time, to make a difference in Hannah's life and possibly save her life. He had one chance to save one life, even if it meant his own life. Why did he make that choice? Because as a Marine, he had been trained to do just that. To respond in the face of adversity for the safety, protection, and welfare of those he had taken an oath to protect. Even though his tour of duty was over. I just, I just want to pause right here. I, I've been amazed over the years as I've pastored. I've been doing this, been serving the Lord for 42 years. I'm always amazed at Christians who try to tell me their tour of duty is over. I've served long enough. I've been involved long enough. I did that long enough. Well, is there not one more soul to read? Hey, Pastor, you're meddling. I need to meddle. We're in a stupid day right now. We're in an amazing day where the church is trying to be redesigned and, and, and reformulated and refit. Come on, we're the church, the living body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're, and we're called to live dead, if you would, to live for a higher call than just a temporary, momentary, momentary existence here on this earth. Hallelujah. So think about it. Even though his tour of duty was over, this was instilled and ingrained into his character. This was not an option. This is what you do because this is who he was. You give your life and you live your life for the safety and the protection of God. That's what he was trained as a Marine to do. You know, the Bible says we're the army of the Lord. We put on the armor of God. We're equipped to do battle and to do warfare. Not just to defend ourselves and to fight the devil off from our little protective dominion. But to fight and do war for the kingdom of God. And to advance his kingdom and to set captives free. Somebody should at least shout one amen this morning. Praise the Lord. So he had been raised to do that and disciplined and discipled to do that. Think about it. He had been discipled and disciplined to respond without thinking. He could not be content to be saved knowing he had left someone behind, perishing in the flame. You know, the Marines have a motto, leave no one behind. Leave no one behind. I think that should be the motto of the church. That we leave no one behind. We're not content to leave anybody behind or to allow anybody to perish if we could have done something about it. The question is, can we simply live our lives content on going to heaven, having escaped the judgment and fire of hell through God's grace and allow others to perish in the flame? Well, praise God, I'm glad I got out. Amen. I have to amen myself this morning, I can tell. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So what happened? Austin chose to possibly die that she might possibly live. Austin made that choice for Hannah. I choose and I know that if I go in to save her, I might possibly die. But her life is worth risking my life to save. That's what we do, guys. So dare we ask, do we really care about people's salvation As much as God does. You see people matter to God. All people everywhere. Everybody matters to God. The the only thing God cares about in this earth is people. And we care about it. Listen the Bible says God's not willing that anybody would perish. And his rescue plan is us. The, The plan of freedom is us. 
The church is God's answer. So as we're looking around and doing that, it's not just about us taking care of ourselves, but something in our life has to be connected to making sure people don't perish. John 3.16 has almost become a throwaway verse for those of us who have grown up or spent a long period of time in the evangelical church. Think about it. We know it. We quote it. We know all the different aspects of it. But do we ever take into consideration the depth of its meaning, the profundity of this action, and the immensity of this love? I want you to think about it as I get ready to close. Think about the love of God that sent His Son from His throne to live in the midst of our human squalor. But not just to live here, to die here. Jesus wasn't sent just to come and live amongst us. He was sent to die for us. He came for one purpose. He stood before Pilate and says, for this purpose, I came into the earth. Where I am right now, I'm on the threshold of fulfilling. Going to the cross, I'm standing here on the threshold of fulfilling my purpose. (coughs) Excuse me. God loves us, the whole world of us, so much that he sent his son as a lamb, not to a battlefield. He sent his son not to a battlefield where there was a chance of dying, but as a lamb is sent to the slaughter with no chance of survival. Jesus did not come just to teach us how to live right. A lot of Christianity today is that I'm, I'm learning how to live right. And even as just think about that, with, with our, our, our national freedom. We can't just have a nice set of standards and expect the whole world to just agree. Oh, those are just such nice people that live there in that nation. Do you understand what has just happened with the COVID virus? This is an attack that was released upon humanity. This was a global attack. This was an engineered virus that was released upon humanity. It was an act and a declaration of war upon humanity. Whenever they trace it back, that's exactly what it was. To to inflict damage and death and destruction upon the human population. This thing is global. Are you doing all right? And so here, you can have all your nice ideas. We can just be nice people, not bother anybody. Just try to get along with everybody. And then wham, you're attacked. An attack. And there's a lot of else that goes with it. But we're not thinking about this maybe in the right perspective. What we're doing is we're backing down thinking, okay, how do I protect myself from this attack? Well, the question is, what are you going to do to protect the freedom of everyone? Amen? Amen. Just some different thoughts. Think about it. Jesus came to die in our place. He chose to give his life that we might live. Here's my question. Eight years later, I wonder how Hannah still feels about Austin. I wonder what Hannah thinks about when she remembers Austin. I wonder how she feels every day when she gets up and looks in the mirror. And she has some scars. And she sees those scars. And those scars remind her of where she was and how she got out of where she was because of a young man named Austin. You know, in our life, when we look in the mirror, we see scars. We have the reminders of our past before we came to Christ. And those scars serve to remind us of where we were before Christ rescued us. So I wonder how Hannah thinks about Austin and I wonder how we should be thinking about Christ who saved us and redeemed us and even those who have given their life on the battlefield for our freedom here in our nation I wonder if she will ever be able to live a life of self-seeking after being saved by the sacrifice of another I don't know who made this quote But I love it. It says this. You have never locked eyes with anyone who does not matter to God. You will never look into the eyes of one person who does not have significance in the eyes of God. 
to God, every life is a soul. And a soul that was worth the life of his son. People matter enough to the Lord that he traded his throne for a stable. And for a cross. That's how much people matter to God. When it comes to Christ. To him we were worth dying for. To me. He's worth living for. A lot of people have asked me over there, Pastor, how can you serve the Lord like you do? How come you can live so committed? Are you kidding me? He died for me. He set me free. Because he died, I live. Amen? That's the only reason I have life. Think about that. He didn't just believe in me. He lived and died for me. I choose the same. My life for his glory. I choose the crucified life of service. And I will give my life. When it comes to our men and women of service to them, we are worth dying for. Do you know every person in the military knows that they could be called at any moment to be put into harm's way to protect you and me. And they've made that choice to be there for us. That their yes meant that their life might literally be on the line to protect us. Our yes to God should have that same impact. Think about it. To me, they are worth living for, living a life that respects their sacrifice. They don't just deserve the use of freedom. They, they don't just use their freedom. They defend it. They are the ones who have lived and died that you and I might be free. So I choose to live a life that makes a difference and that honors theirs. I will give my life. You see, I want to live like I've been pulled from the flames at the expense of another's life. How do people answer the call? I remember what I was saved from. There's a reason the Apostle Paul always shared his testimony. If you read his life, you'll find people always go, well, I wonder what Paul preached. How did he go and share? Paul shared his testimony before he ever gave some biblical discourse. He says, I'm Paul, who used to be Saul of Tarsus. I was a persecutor of the church. I would imprison, enslave, and even have Christians put to death because of their faith in Christ. And while I was on a journey to imprison Christians, the Lord met me on a road. And by grace, he saved me, and he gave me purpose, and he forgave me of all of my wrongs against him. And I have given my life to proclaim his love and his grace, and to tell everyone I can of this amazing Savior who lived for me and gave his life for me and set me free. And then... He would preach the gospel. You read it where Paul stood before Agrippa. He says, there I was on the road persecuting the church. He gives his account. Every time he spoke for himself, he began with the testimony of who he was and how Christ forgave him. In other words, he said, I am a man who's been pulled from the flames by the life of another. And I'm living to honor the life that was given to save me from perishing. That's how we're called to live. You see, for all of us, why do we live that way? Because I have the scars from my past and they're proof of the flames and that I would have perished if not for Christ. You see, when I was 25, I made a phone call to my dad who I hadn't lived with since I was two. And I was in such a mess in my life that I said this in Montana. I was living up in Montana. My dad was living in Yuba City. This is what I said on the phone. I said, Dad, can I come home? I said, if I can't get out of here, I won't be alive much longer. Because see, to me, I'd lost everything that meant anything to me. I'd made a complete failure of my life. And miraculously, my dad had given his life back to the Lord. 
and he opened his home. And my dad and my stepmom received me into their home. And three weeks after coming there, I committed my life to Christ. But I had nothing. And I look back and I look at what God had done for my life. And I have the scars of the flames that I was trapped in. You and I have the scars. And we need to remember that someone gave his life to pull us from the wreckage and the flames that we were trapped in. And we need to live with the same cause and abandonment that nobody else would perish. We've been set free. Amen. I kind of look at it like this. If I was to lay my life down today for the cause of somebody else, look at the years I've had of freedom. Look at the years of life that I've been given. And I'm serious. If my dad hadn't been, had said yes, I'm serious, I wouldn't care, because I did not care anymore. I was not trying to commit suicide, but I was involuntarily trying. I didn't care. I was whacking out on drugs and drinking. I was having wrecks, and just, I I was in a self-destruct mode. I didn't care what happened to my life any longer. I just knew that if I stayed there, I wouldn't be alive much longer. And the grace of God, the grace of God, spared me how can I not live for him and there's not one person who's truly accepted Christ that doesn't have that same testimony and there's none of us here today that have the freedom to do what we're doing today even under these gracious restrictions That freedom has been paid for and preserved by people who gave their lives for us. Lives have been given. Blood has been shed for the cause of freedom so we can live free today. Watch this next video as the worship team comes back.
one of the, I believe, most important parts of our gathering together is the altar call. Is that we're given a chance to respond to Christ. And there's a handful of us here today, and there's those who have been joining, but I'm going to ask you all to bow your heads right now. And I want to challenge you with the call to the cause of freedom. Are we living like one who has been pulled from the flames? at the expense of the life of another do I realize if men and women hadn't given their lives to protect the freedom of this nation that none of the things that I call my rights my liberties my privileges would be available to me today Am I living to honor and respect their sacrifice? Have I named Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior? Am I aware that the reason He gave His life is because I was trapped in the fires of hell? And if He hadn't given His life for me, If he hadn't been willing to descend into hell to set captives free, I would be lost in those flames forever. Are we living as people rescued from the fire by a life freely given in love for us? Today I want to challenge you If you've never given your life to Christ, He's here as a Savior right now to rescue you from the flames of hell that you would not perish. He gave His life for you to be free. With your heads bowed, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I thank You today for Your amazing love and Your amazing grace through the gift of your son in giving his life for me so that I could be rescued from the flame of sin and the punishment of hell. Today I confess Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And from this day on, I will live as one whose life has been spared by the life of another. In Jesus' name, amen. Now as Christians today, maybe this is just a challenge for each and every one of us. Am I living living for the cause of freedom? Am I available? Am I willing to live and to give of myself to protect, preserve, and rescue the life of another? Can God call upon me? Am I willing to volunteer for service? Am I willing to enlist into the cause of Christ that men and women would not perish? Because every man, all of humanity, is significant in the eyes of God. So I'm going to ask you right where you are in your home and those of you here, if you need to make an affirming vow to God, if you need to reaffirm your commitment to say yes to the Lord, to live for the cause of Christ, then those of you who are here, I'm going to invite you to move to this altar and just bend a knee for a moment and affirm a yes to God in your heart they're going to lead us in a song of worship and right there where you're at as they lead us in the song of worship I'm going to invite you just to bow a knee right where you are 
just to say yes in your heart to God. God, I'm here. I'm saying yes to you. I'm going to live for the cause of Christ. I'm not going to allow the culture of this day, the circumstances of this day to change me, to move me, to shrink me, to confine me, to cause me to become an individual, to cause me to think only about myself. I'm going to live for the cause of Christ. I'm going to live for the one who gave his life for me that others might be saved in Jesus name as they sing the Lord leads you you come you need to make that exchange you need to find that place of prayer you need to affirm that yes in your heart to God then move to this altar right now bow your knee right where you're at let's say yes to God come on next week is Pentecost Sunday we're going to move into Pentecost Sunday with fresh fire fresh zeal fresh commitment fresh expectancy to see what God would do in and through our lives in Jesus name hallelujah
Lord, we thank you today. We thank you for the precious gift of your son, Jesus Christ. And Father, today we pray your blessing. We pray your blessing over the families and the lives of the men and women who have so graciously, nobly, courageously given their lives and sacrificed for the service of our freedom. For those who have laid so costly a price, as Abraham Lincoln said, on the altar of our freedom. Father, we pray your grace, your comfort, your peace over these families. Lord, we thank you that these were men and women of courage and conviction who loved enough to live their life in a way that didn't just serve themselves but served the freedom and the protection of everything that they believe in. Father, may we so live to exemplify that same character in our lives to protect the freedom of our nation and to proclaim the freedom of the cross. To honor you with our lives. So we say yes to you. Thank you for your amazing grace. That brought you into the flames of our lives. And rescued us. And brought us out into your presence. We say yes to you. With all that we are. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We love you. God bless you. Thank you for being with us today. Be blessed in the Lord. Make a difference in somebody's life. Live for the cause of freedom. And uh, join us next week. We'll have an email out letting you know all the particulars. We look forward to seeing you next Sunday. Join us Wednesday night for our live service. We'll have a live broadcast here on Wednesday night as well. God bless you. We love you.